What's going on, y'all? Welcome into the Two Stripes Podcast and the first episode of the Distant Replay series here on the podcast. My name is Colton Denning, and I am your host. I hope all of you are doing well right now. I uh, hope you're staying safe. Hope you're staying inside. Um, I know I'm doing my best. I have, I've left the house like three times in the last month. I've gone for a, a grocery pickup in the car uh, right after I'm done recording this. But I'm doing my best. I'm away from family, away from my girlfriend, but cherishing each day. And uh, I hope you guys are doing the same through these tough times. And uh, thinking of all you, and I appreciate you guys taking any sort of time to listen to today's show. And I hope that it, uh, that it can entertain you. And I really do appreciate you taking the time. There's no real non-coronavirus college football news out there right now, and, and rightfully so, other than like kids from the 2021 class committing, but this isn't a recruiting show, so I, I don't want to talk about that. But th- there's nothing going on right now, and just like everybody else, what I've been doing with no live sports is I've been watching old games. I've got a pretty lengthy YouTube playlist set up with a lot of college football games, a lot of NBA games, a lot of NBA highlights up there, and just trying to work my way through it and, and taking the time to watch a bunch of old stuff. And I figured I, ha- I had the very unoriginal idea because everybody else is doing this is, you know, why not make it a part of the pod and talk about something, talk about a game that happened in the past. And so I came up with this distant replay series that I'm going to do for the foreseeable future here on the podcast. And the basic premise is it's like any kind of rewatchable thing or or look back sort of podcast where, you know, I want to not just look at the game itself, but everything that went into the game, the lead up of the game, the story of the game, the aftermath of the game, the lasting legacy of the game and how, how it fits in to how we watch and look at college football so i'm going to be watching uh, it's classic might not be the right word because i mean a lot of these games are classic but just games that fascinate me and games that i think you know after 10 15 years you can look back on and say like oh that was that was a moment i remember exactly where i was i remember who i watched that with and i remember what that did to college football and why college football is different because of that game so i'm going to try to watch through a lot of cool games. I hope you guys watch along with me and we can enjoy some cool college football moments together. So with that in mind, my first step into doing this was, okay, which game am I going to do first? Because there's thousands of games to choose from over the history of college football and plenty of them are on YouTube and there's great finishes, big upsets, landmark games, you know, single game performances from a player that are that are legendary. There's a lot of great moments and great games to choose from. But really, when it came down to it, there was one that I had to do first and made more sense than any of the others. And that's Appalachian State upsetting Michigan to start the 2007 season. And I started this for a couple reasons. One, it's really, when you look back at it, it's I think the most fascinating game in college football history, not just because of what happened on the field and it's the biggest upset of all time, bar none. We'll, we'll start there and it's a wonderful game with a great finish. But when you look back, what 13 years later now, it's left a real legacy on the game of college football and not just that, but like broadcasting and, the way the game is played, like everything wraps up within this game. And I'll try to get into that deeper as we we get into the show. But just going back and watching, it really was fascinating. Like it's not just a great upset. It's not just a a very rewatchable game, but it, it really left some roots in college football that we've seen sprout up over the last 13 years. And then secondly, and I think this is why most people think that I'm doing this game is, I mean, I have a built in fan base that's going to really enjoy watching Michigan lose to Appalachian state. I love watching Michigan lose as an Ohio state fan. So it was natural on both fronts to want to start with this game. And uh, I I think it's a perfect way to kick this off. And I, I hope you watch it with me and I hope you follow along here on the podcast. And uh, cause I, I had a lot of fun doing this and I think that it'll be worth your time before we get into the game while we're on the subject of, watching old games and old highlights 
Um, if you're looking for old stuff to watch or even new stuff to watch, go to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Colton Denning. A um, lot of player highlights up there. This podcast will be up there if you want to listen to it there. But by the time you're listening to this, Mike Evans, Texas A&M highlights, I should have those up there. I just put up a trio of Miami players, Ray Lewis, Warren Sapp, and Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Just put their highlights up there. These are all kind of long form videos, no music, strictly highlights. I've got a lot of classic Ohio State players up there, a lot of guys in the NFL draft this season, and uh, just great college football players. Percy Harvin's Florida highlights, Mike Williams' USC highlights, Ed Reed, when he was at Miami, Eric Berry at Tennessee. So go check that out if you're looking to uh, to pass some time with college football stuff and some of the best players ever, youtube.com slash Colton Denning. Let me know what you think about it. I'm on Twitter at Dubs Co. And uh, while you're doing all that, subscribe to the show if you like it and leave me some feedback. Just search Two Straps Podcast on Apple Podcasts and uh, Spotify and SoundCloud as well. You can find the show. All right, now that all the self-promotion is out of the way. Let's talk about App State and Michigan. And first of all, if you want to watch this game, uh, there's plenty of options for you on YouTube. There's the full game broadcast, which is like two hours, 45 minutes long. That's the one I watched because I wanted to get the full scope of everything happening. There's a 10 minute drive through highlight video from Our Honor Defend, 20 minute video from Harris Highlights, and then a 33 minute video from CFB and 30 uploads. So there's plenty of options to watch the game. I'm partial to the full broadcast just to stretch out the Michigan agony for almost three hours. And it was great to put that on while I took a little internet time machine back to the summer of 2007 and tried to get the stories for the lead up of this game. And for Michigan, they're coming off of this incredible 2006 where they just roll through the season and they're undefeated heading into this game against Ohio State where it's number one versus number two. Winner's going to win the Big Ten. The winner's going to go to the national championship. It's the biggest Ohio State-Michigan game ever. There was a ton of hype. I remember I was 16 at the time and it just felt like the biggest thing in the world. It was the latest Ohio State-Michigan start in Ohio Stadium history. I think it was a 330 kickoff, which is just like unprecedented when it comes to that rivalry because it's always a morning game but it was this titanic showdown and both teams are undefeated and Michigan's been plowing through teams all season long they had this great defense that an early season game against Notre Dame where I think Notre Dame was favored at home and Michigan bulldozes them there's a YouTube video I don't know if it's still up of all of Michigan's highlights coming at Notre Dame's expense set to yakety sacks it's one of the first college football videos on YouTube that I can remember. And that was the moment where I think Michigan kind of put the rest of the country on notice. Like, okay, these guys are these guys are for real. These guys came to play this season. And for the rest of the year, you know, they basically cruised through. And by the middle of, or not the middle of September, but late September, people were already talking about like Ohio State and Michigan are going to be undefeated. What's going to happen? This is going to be amazing. So everything is going their way until literally a day before the game when Bo Schembechler dies. And I think people outside of Michigan and Ohio State and I guess, you know, the Big Ten in general don't really understand the significance of this moment. Outside of Michigan fans, I don't think anybody understands how big of a deal this was for Michigan athletics and the lasting legacy that it's left. I'm not sure that Michigan has ever fully recovered from Shen Beckler dying. I think the last few years, Jim Harbaugh has provided a lot of stability, regardless of how polarizing he is. I think that internally he's brought some serious stability to that athletic department that went away when Bo Shen Beckler died. If, if you guys have read Third and Long, which is John U. Bacon's book about Rich Rodriguez's tenure, uh, this is the moment, Shen Beckler dying, where everything goes into chaos. And I think a lot of their struggles prior to Harbaugh getting there can be traced back to Shen Beckler dying and a lot of people, you know, trying to seize that power and nobody really being on the same page and everything kind of just all being a mess. It all traces back to that. So it's a really significant moment and it happens the day before the biggest Ohio State Michigan game ever. 
So that happens, and then they play. It's one of my favorite games of all time, obviously. It's maybe the best Ohio State-Michigan game ever, but they lose 42-39, to and they barely miss out on playing for the national championship. They, they almost lost and played in it anyway, and there was almost a rematch for that game, but they don't make it in, and their consolation is the Rose Bowl, which is pretty damn good. But they get there... And USC kind of beats the brakes off of them. I know if you look at the box score, I think it was 32 to 18. That score was not indicative of how bad USC beat them in that game. So they end the season on a really sour note. You know, the patriarch of their whole athletic department dies. They lose to Ohio State the next day, miss out on the national championship, and then they get pantsed in the Rose Bowl. So it's a tough way to end the 2006 season for Michigan. But they pretty much win the offseason because Chad Henney, Mike Hart, and offensive tackle Jake Long all decide, hey, we're going to come back for our senior season. We haven't beat Ohio State yet, and we want to win a national championship. So Michigan rolls into summer fifth in the preseason poll. They're one of the most hyped teams in the country. And I, I know that this App State game has kind of colored the lens on how people looked at that Michigan team at the start of the season. But they were legit national championship contenders, especially when you factor in that Ohio State had just graduated the Heisman Trophy winner in Troy Smith. Ted Ginn left. Ohio State starting running back Antonio Pittman was gone. They had a really young defense. So this, this was Michigan's times to, at, at very least, win the Big Ten and to kind of seize control of the Big Ten away from Ohio State. And this was their moment. They have all these key players back. So Michigan goes into the season looking as strong as they had since probably maybe you know 2003 or the 1997 season when they won the national championship. It just so happens that they're going to start the season against a back-to-back national champion in Appalachian State. Because at this time, it was 1AA then in FCS. I think at the start of the season, that's when they transitioned it to football championship subdivision. App State had won the last two national championships and uh, their head coach Jerry Moore was in his 19th season there and they're, they're just they're rolling. They have this spread identity that we'll talk about in a little and as you can see from the this game they know exactly who they are. They know exactly what they want to do, what players they're going after and how they fit into their roles both offensively and defensively and it's it's cool to note as you watch and they show you know they show more about Appalachian State and they talk more about them that uh, Scott Satterfield is the quarterback coach for Appalachian State in this game and of course he moves up to head coach in 2013 has six very successful seasons and then took the Louisville job last year and turned them around almost right away so fun to see that Scott Satterfield was in the midst of, of working his way up the ladder at App State during this game. A couple of other random notes before we get into the game itself. This is the first game broadcast in Big Ten Network history. They had launched the whole network literally the day before, and they had just been taking hits all summer because they couldn't hammer out deals with everyone. And at this time, the idea of a conference network, especially in college, was just like absurd. So they were just getting killed left and right about people not being able to see it. And then like, oh, the, your first game is App State, Michigan. And the game lineup, those early game lineups on Big Ten Network were not great. And so it was basically everybody just looking at them like, this is so unnecessary. Why would you even do that? So we'll get to talking about them a little bit later on as we get through it and dive more into the broadcast itself. But it's the first broadcast in Big Ten Network history. That's pretty cool. There was no betting line, and uh, App State got $400,000 to appear and show up in Ann Arbor, which was, I think, money well earned by them for that one. The first thing that I noticed and wrote down as this game starts is that these type of season openers are always so weird, and it's almost impossible to fully win if you're the home team because the crowd expects nothing less than like a 50-point blowout and a shutout. And when you do what Michigan does on the first drive and you score right away, I mean, they just move right down the field. The crowd is super fired up because football's back and they're going crazy. But there's also that atmosphere of like, "Eh, this isn't a conference game. Like we're not going to make a ton of noise and we should beat these guys anyway. So we're not going to completely go nuts 
And then these games go one of two ways. Either it does snowball and you end up winning like 60 to nothing. You shut the team out. You put your backups and your third stringers in by the middle of the second quarter and you're just rolling and it's great. Or at some point there's a counter punch and that counter punch always takes a crowd out of the game, no matter what. Even if you make plays after that, the crowd, it, it loses, it's like at 80% from what it was uh, at the start of the game. And I've seen this so many times, especially like just with Ohio State. I think it was 2013, they were playing Buffalo. And that was when Buffalo had Khalil Mack. And Khalil Mack just wrecked havoc on their offensive line. He had a play where he tipped the ball up to himself on a swing pass that Braxton Miller threw, picked it off, and like went down to the five. And at that point, like there, there was never a point in that game where Ohio State was going to lose, but the crowd was on edge, even when they were up like 30 points. And I think it's because of this game. This game led to these kind of cupcake matchups, for lack of a better term, to be like if a team scores and even if it's 14 nothing and they score to make it 14 to 7 it's like oh god is this are we going to get abstated like is this really going to happen to us i really think that that's one of the first lasting impacts that this game has had going forward is that it put everybody on notice and that when you're you know you're kind of struggling early it's you have that feeling of like oh boy is this our app state moment so that's that's where the first lasting legacy of this game because michigan goes right down and scores pretty easily it looks like they're gonna roll but then right away app state 68 yard touchdown slant pass to uh dexter jackson who's a socon 200 meter dash champion just blows away the michigan defense and it's fitting that they score like that because it highlights the difference in styles between these two teams and that to me outside of just you know what happens in the magnitude of the upset is what makes this game a classic and shows where college football was at at the time because on one hand you have Michigan who's this slug it out offense with a big offensive line who's going to push you around physical run game and they're built around running the ball with a play action attack they have at the time, you know, and I guess still your your prototypical 6'4", tall guy, big arm quarterback in Chad Henney and a large front seven on defense with big linebackers who are just going to annihilate you if you try to do anything over the middle of the field. And then there's App State, who's a complete 180 philosophically from that. And it's funny because for Jerry Moore's first, I want to say 15 or 16 years, they were exclusively an I formation slug it out team. And in 2005, they're coming off a six and five season, back to back years, not making the playoffs. He makes the decision to say, hey, we're scrapping all this. I'm scrapping my whole philosophy. We're going spread, no huddle. And not only that, they've got this quarterback in Armani Edwards, who's a left handed dual threat, listed at 5'11, can't be taller than. 510 and they're they're going five wide from the jump no huddle they're they've got track guys at wide receiver and smaller players everywhere and they're just carving Michigan up with this spread no huddle philosophy and then meanwhile if you look at uh, Michigan's third down on their second drive they go shotgun for the first time and Chad Henney gets absolutely blasted on a weak side blitz. And, and I thought that was a real poignant moment of like, wow, you look at this one team who is just killing them with spread and the shotgun. And then Michigan who has to do it when the situation warrants it. And Chad Henney just gets the brakes beaten off of him. And like I said earlier, one of the great things about this game is that it shows where college football was at stylistically in 2007. Edwards is coming off this freshman season in 06 where he became only the fifth quarterback in Division I history to have a single season where he threw for more than 2,000 yards and ran for more than 1,000 yards. Now, like if you're a dual threat quarterback and, and you want to win the Heisman or you want to make some noise, like you, you better run for like 1,300 yards and throw for 3,000 yards. It's just, it's changed completely. I mean, to the point where, like I did the research, it's happened 30 times since then. So it's still, it's not something that's happening like 10 times a year since then, but like it's, it's so much more common now and the stats are even bigger 
Since then, there have been 10 3,000, 1,000 seasons. There have been two 4,000, 1,000 seasons. And you you really deep dive into some of these seasons and see what these players are doing. And it's just, it's unfathomable. Some of my favorites here are Jordan Lynch, if you remember him, from Northern Illinois. He almost did a 3,000, 2,000 twice in 2012 and 2013. He was 80 yards away from a 2,000, 2,000 in 2013, which that's just mind boggling. Some other ones here, probably the, the best one, Lamar Jackson, his 2016 and 2017, uh, that first year is Heisman season, 3,500 passing yards, 1,500 rushing yards. And then the next season, he went 3,600 and 1,600. Absolutely obscene. And then uh, finally, Kyler Murray's 2018, 4,300 passing yards, 1,000 rushing yards, and 54 total touchdowns. That's that's absurd. Uh, Colin Kaepernick, as a side note, he's the only one to do it three times. So shout out to Cap. We're going to talk about him here in uh, two or three weeks. He's going to be on one of these episodes. So stay tuned to that. Anyway, in 2007, that was like unheard of that you could do that. And it probably wasn't talked about as much, especially with Edwards, because he was a one double A guy. But now guys are doing this and they're the first pick in the draft. So it's just fun to see how much the you know, the rise of the dual threat quarterback has exploded and how big of a role that has played in college football and offenses in general. That brings me to what I have written down as side note number one that has nothing to do with this game. And that's, this is my favorite era of college football ever. From probably 2002 to 2009, there were a lot of strong teams. Ohio State was rolling pretty good. USC was in the midst of their decade-long run. Florida was starting their dynasty. They're coming off that first national championship. Alabama's, you know, in the, in the infancy of what they were doing. But there's a ton of strong teams, and there's a lot of star power within college football at this point. And honestly, the reason why this is my favorite era is that at this point, college football still felt like a secret. Like for diehard college football fans, it still felt like Saturdays were kind of like our thing. And nobody else knew about it because games weren't as widely televised as they are now. College football wasn't talked about on shows like First Take or the you know the lead on Sports Center. It was something that was just kind of ours. And honestly, in this era, it's way less NFLized in the coverage and the way that people talk about it than it is now because now a guy has a huge week one as a freshman. And the talk immediately is like, should this guy just sit out for the next two years and wait for the 2025 NFL draft? Or is this guy the best player ever as a freshman? Like, is this guy better than Bo Jackson? So it's just the the coverage of it is so much stronger. And this, like going back to tracking it, it really started with Jameis Winston against Pitt in week one, 2013. I remember watching that game and he was like 25 of 28 for five touchdowns or something. And I think Van Pelt had him on the show afterwards and they were already talking about him in the NFL draft. And, you know, would he be the number one quarterback prospect? So that's when, in my mind, this kind of NFL way of looking through the college football lens really started. And then it jumped the shark the next season with Kenny Hill at Texas A&M in their week one when he went nuts against South Carolina and what his parents trademarked Kenny Trill and then everything went off the rails. So I, I think this is back in an era where college football still to me felt like a secret and that's why I love it so much. Anyway, back to talking about this game. I forgot that Michigan actually had a 14-7 lead after the first quarter, which is funny because one, App State ties it up right away to start the second quarter and the crowd still is at a point where they, they don't even have nervous energy yet. It's just like, oh, this is just week one. This is how they're just going to look. They're shaking off the rust. And two, what really stands out about this game is that App State's basically in control for the whole game. Even when they were down in the first quarter, even when Michigan takes the lead late, it, it still always feels like App State is in control of this game and that's what I love about it because it doesn't feel like a one in a million upset like the Stanford USC game if you go back and watch that's a one in a million upset Stanford wasn't going to do that again not that it was a fluke but it was just something that that doesn't make a lot of sense in retrospect 
This one, it really does because App State doesn't, they don't really catch many breaks at all. And in fact, Michigan catches mostly all the breaks. It would have been a shame if App State lost because they totally deserved a win. This wasn't one of those upsets where, you know, they recovered six fumbles and they had a pick six, a tip pick six go their way and, you know, a blown officiating call and they, they got lucky and scored off of it. They outplayed Michigan for the whole game and they're, they're really in control. And it's, it's interesting going back and watching that and seeing this team that's playing so sound be in control of this blue blood powerhouse who everybody thinks is a legitimate national title contender. So they have control or most of it early on, but then they really put their foot on the gas pedal with about 10 minutes left in the second quarter. Dexter Jackson scores again, completely uncovered again to make it 21 to 14. And then Michigan gets the ball and they get stopped on a fourth down. And then App State goes 65 yards in nine plays in less than five minutes, completely carves them up. And Edwards caps it all off with a quarterback draw on third and goal to make it 24 to 18 with two minutes and 15 seconds left in the half. And it's just a beautiful thing to watch. He's he's in control the whole time. And they just, they work their way right down the field. And uh, it, it reminded me, the quarterback draw when he scores, that one of the first like running college football memes I remember was Michigan in this era's inability to stop any sort of dual threat quarterback. I think Ron English was the defensive coordinator at this time. And that was always the thing like, it, does Ron English just not know what to do against running quarterbacks? And it really, it was more than just a meme. Like it was a thing. Troy Smith had run on him in 2004 and a little bit in 2005. Uh, Armani Edwards does this. Dennis Dixon does him super dirty the next week. And there's just like this four year stretch where if, if Michigan's playing a mobile quarterback, they're getting absolutely carved up. It's also important to note that Armani Edwards' first half is an absolute masterpiece. Not only is he in control and the offense is moving, moving smooth, whether they're running or throwing, but statistically, at this point, at, at, after the first half, Armani Edwards is 7 of 7 for 139 yards and 3 touchdowns and has 8 carries for 41 yards and a touchdown. And after they make it, after his quarterback draw makes it 28 to 14, that's when we get to the moment of the whole broadcast. My favorite moment of the whole game, if you watch the full broadcast, it's at the 1 hour, 12 minute, and 48 second mark. And there's this shot of Edwards on the bench after they scored and uh, they're, they're, they're talking about him. And you can hear all the App State players, you know, they're, they're going crazy. They're super hyped up and, you know, they're, they're talking their stuff. And then out of nowhere, you can't see the guy, but you just hear an App State player say, we the real number one. Too late to play until halftime. The Wolverines have all three timeouts hey, remaining. Real number one. And remember, they've got the perfect... Guys say stuff on the sideline like that every single game, even if they're, you know, the fifth string wide receiver and they say that nobody can guard them or they're about to get slaughtered by 40. Guys talk on the sideline. It is what it is. But there's something about that clip in the way that whoever that player is, the way that he says that, where like even now just talking about it, it makes the hairs on my arm stand up because it feels like, oh man. These guys aren't phased at all. Like, these guys know they're the better team. And to be honest, like, they really were the real number one. They were the back to back national champions in one double A, and they're not scared of these guys at all. And they knew that they were the better team. So I thought that that clip is super fitting for this game, and it really shows the mindset of where App State is. The wildest thing about everything, though, is that after all of this, App State's up 28 to 14. It looks like they're going to go into halftime with a two score lead. Is that the crowd still hasn't really completely turned on Michigan, even though they're losing 28 to 14 to App State? But it finally happens at the end of the first half. And it's one of my favorite things in the world because Michigan drives down, they get inside the 10 yard line, they've got first and goal. Looks like they're going to score. App State holds on the first two plays. And then on third and goal, there's pressure. And Henny just throws the ball away. And they send the field goal unit on. And the crowd is not having it. 
They kept the tight end Massey in the game, and it's still pressure. And on fourth down now, they have to kick a field goal following that incompleted pass. And everyone's upset and wanted them to go for it. There's some indecision. Who's in, who's out on the kick team? To make matters worse, they have to take a timeout when they send the field goal unit on because the guys get on the field and there's only 10 of them, and there's just like this super confusion of who, you know, how many players do we have? Who's the next guy? And then Mike Hart puts his helmet on, and he's not on the kick team, but he puts his helmet on and he runs out on the field to go be a protector. Like, nobody else is going to do it. I'm going to do it. And so Michigan has to take a timeout. The crowd boos that. Then they come back out again. They make the kick. The crowd boos that. And App State runs out the rest of the first half and they boo the players off the field. And it's such a disaster that Carissa Thompson is waiting for Lloyd Carr to do the halftime coaches interview before they go into the locker room and Carr just runs right past her. It's such a mess. It's unbelievable. Since we're at halftime, uh, that brings me to side note number two that I wrote down. And I said earlier that I would talk more about Big Ten Network in depth. And for this being their first game broadcast... It was surprisingly less buggy than I remembered because a lot of the early Big Ten Network broadcasts and even studio shows were just super rough if you watched around that time. Up until maybe like even 2012 or 2013, they just really couldn't get the hang of whether it was you know, how they were going to have personalities on or some of the play-by-play guys and color commentary guys. It just felt very second rate. And this one, at least like technically, I thought was pretty good. And I was surprised to go back and watch and see that they didn't have more hiccups. Uh, When it comes to the broadcast team, it was Tom Brenneman on play-by-play and Charles Davis on color commentary. And the first thing that stood out was like right away, they were wearing hideous suits. They look like NFL Hall of Fame jacket, a Jace colored suits, and it just it doesn't work. And I don't think they stuck to that very long. I don't know if there was any Big Ten Network branding on that, but it was not the look. But as for the guys themselves, Charles Davis is always great, always brings a lot of knowledge, a lot of tidbits. I thought he was he was fun to listen to on this broadcast, especially him just talking about App State and some of the stuff that they did. Tom Brenneman, on the other hand, I will tell you guys, is my least favorite college football play-by-play guy ever. And like, I don't even know who would be second because he is so far out ahead. This is that era where Fox had the rights to, I think, every BCS broadcast except for the Rose Bowl. And their coverage was so bad. And Big Ten Network is an arm of Fox, but... Fox like actually would have those BCS games in their team would be uh, Tom Brenneman and Charles Davis. They had done the national championship the year before with Ohio state and Florida and Brenneman is just, uh, he's almost unlistenable and it, it really peaks in the 2010 sugar bowl between Florida and Cincinnati where it's Tim Tebow's last game and Brenneman puts on, Maybe the biggest all-time stinker from a play-by-play guy in not only college football history, but sports history. I I don't know if I'll ever watch that game again because it was so bad because of some of the stuff he was saying during that broadcast. And uh, I I don't think I've ever forgiven him for that. He's, He's probably not as bad as I'm saying right now, but I have never forgiven him for that game. And really this whole era of college football where Fox had a lot of the rights. They they've done so much better now with Joel Klatt and um, Gus Johnson as the, as their lead guys. But at this point, it just felt like a third-rate broadcast. And Brenneman, for me, is just, he's unlistenable, pretty much. Also, the Joey Votto thing plays into that, too. Like, how, how can you not think Joey Votto is a great baseball player? Like, whatever. I, I don't like Tom Brenneman, as you guys can tell. I spent most of the early part of the third quarter of this game basically just searching for the this is happening moment. And this is happening is a running thing between me and my buddy E, who we we probably first did this like 15 years ago. And it's a moment in a great upset, or it can just be just a great sporting event in general, where you kind of just sit back and you have that thought of like, oh my God, this is happening. And it can happen whether you're a casual viewer 
or if you're a fan of a team that this is happening to. Like Michigan fans, at this point, they're booing, but they haven't accepted it yet that this is happening to them. So even though they were down 28-17 at half, it still is like, okay, like we just didn't play really well. They haven't come to the acceptance stage yet. And this is something that happens every single NCAA tournament, except for this year, obviously. But like Virginia and UMBC, me and E were watching that whenever that was, two years ago or whatever. And UMBC starts hitting those threes with like 12 minutes left in the third and they're up 20. And you're just like, oh my God, this this is happening. And it happens in college football too, like LSU, A&M. It can be a great game like that. It got to the third overtime and we were like, holy shit, this is happening. So the this is happening moment, you can always spot it in a great upset. And that's what I was trying to find in this game. Was Where is that exact moment where, whether as a viewer or the Michigan fans had to accept that it was happening? The this is happening moment of this game is a sequence. So App State kicks a field goal to go up 31-20 with 8-13 left in the third, and on the ensuing kickoff, uh, they kick it into the end zone, and Michigan's returner is like four or five yards deep. He fumbles the ball, and it rolls out of the end zone. So at this point, he has to pick it up, and he has to run with it. He can't get anywhere. He gets tackled at like the 11, and the crowd is like murmuring. You can tell they're starting to get angry. And then on first down, Henny drops back, and he throws a one-yard dump off to the fullback. And the crowd just erupts with boos. Two plays later, Brandon Miner fumbles inside the 30-yard line and App State recovers. And at this point, Michigan's crowd is just fully against them. And that's that's the moment. It's like the moment in the tournament where like the 13 seed has been in control against the 4 seed all game. They've been playing really well. They've been hitting their shots. But then with like 10 minutes left in the second half, that powerhouse team, the four seed, the three seed starts to make a run and they cut a 18 point deficit down to seven. And you feel like, okay, these guys are just, they're, they're going to come back and they're going to reassert themselves and they're going to win this game. And the underdog comes down and they get an and one. And at that moment, you everybody's kind of just like, oh, no, no, they're not coming back. Like, this is the thing. They're going to lose. That's what that moment feels like to me. Even though App State gets the ball and they they miss the field goal, it still is in that moment, that sequence for Michigan, where I felt like, okay, th- this is happening. This is a real thing. This isn't a fluke. And because of that, I started wondering, like, how in the world does Michigan hang in this and eventually get the lead? And as you watch through, it's basically, it's exclusively thanks to one person. And that's Mike Hart, who in this game goes off, has 23 carries for 188 yards and three touchdowns, which, you know, you could say, oh, it's against App State. But he was also injured in this game. He was on the exercise bike for a large stretch of this game, which is why Brandon Miner was in the game and fumbled. But for a large portion of the second and third quarters, they show multiple shots of him on the sideline, just on the exercise bike without his helmet on, trying to get back into the game. And in that next Michigan drive, he comes in and he energizes not only the whole team, but the whole atmosphere changes when he gets into the game and starts, you know, ripping off five, six, 10 yard runs. And eventually he scores to make it 31 to 26 at the end of the third. And at this point, he's the only reason that they're even really in this game. And by then, after Michigan scores to make it a five-point game, it kind of gets into a holding pattern where both teams don't really want to make a mistake. App State has kind of gotten away from what they did well in the first half. They don't want to make a mistake. And then Michigan, they're trying to fight back, but they can't quite get over the hump. And that lasts from the end of the third or that middle portion of the third where Michigan scores up until like 4.30 left in the fourth quarter where again, Mike Hart is the guy who steps up and on the first play, they get the ball after a punt. He goes 54 yards to the house and it's an amazing run. If you're going to watch only a couple plays from this game, you have to watch this play because he jukes a couple dudes. He breaks a tackle, reverses field 
gets to the other side of the field and at the 10 yard line stutter steps a guy and gets into the end zone completely breaks the guy's ankle and gives Michigan a 32 to 31 lead it's the most amazing thing because Michigan has gotten completely outplayed and now there's four minutes left and they have the lead honestly I tried to think of things to compare this run to and the only thing I could come up with and I'm sorry if this is blasphemous but it's like a junior beast quake. It's like the college football version of the beast quake. It's an amazing run where it's just one guy who basically does everything. He he leaves like five or six App State defenders in his wake. And it's honestly the perfect play to describe Michigan's game that day. Because you look at it and basically everyone else is just like f-ing up out there. And my card's just like, no. Everybody get on my back. Like, I'm tired of this. I'm going to win the game for us. I'm injured. The rest of you are worthless, but we're going to win because of me. Get behind me. And it's funny to hear me like ramble on about this because Mike Hart is one of my least favorite college football players of all time. But it's honestly really valiant in a way that this guy is fighting through injuries. Everybody on his team isn't showing up and he just says, hey, get on my back, and and this play really showcases it near the end. And it honestly ends up almost being the seminal moment from this game. Like, we were really close to this whole moment not being a part of history because on the first App State play after that, Armani Edwards throws a pick, and there's like 420 left. And you're thinking like, really? This is how it's going to end? This is how this upset bid is going to end. And we were so close to this not being a thing. And it would have been a shame. And and I'm not saying that just from an Ohio State fan perspective, because I love seeing Michigan's misery. But Michigan, outside of Mike Hart, did like nothing to win this game. They totally didn't deserve to win this game. And thankfully, they don't do anything with the ball. They can't run the clock out. They can't get a first down. And they kick the ball and it's blocked. And people will always forget about the first block because of what's to come. But that Mike Hart run really almost ends up being the thing that we would have looked back 13 years from now or then and thought like, oh man, remember when App State almost beat Michigan, but Mike Hart ripped off that run? That was almost the thing that you know we could have remembered about this game. But thankfully, it doesn't play out that way. So after the kick gets blocked, it's 32-31 Michigan. There's a minute 37 left. And App State has the ball on their own 26. And watching it in the moment, I I mean, I don't remember what I felt like in the moment, but I could imagine that after seeing App State's offense for most of the second half, you couldn't have been very confident that they were going to move the ball down and score. They really hadn't done anything. They turned the ball over, and they just didn't look anything like they did in the first half. But for some reason, like they just re-realized, like, hey, these guys have no answer for what we do best. Why don't we just go back to doing that? And sure enough, on first down, Edwards has a 15-yard scramble right up the middle and gets to the sideline that sets the whole tone for the drive. And they get down to the five in six plays, like totally easy. And it's so composed and so in control. Like they just remembered, hey, you know what? We're we're better than these guys. We've been killing them all game. Why don't we just do that? And they move the ball right down the field. And they get down to the five-yard line after just a brilliant play by Edwards, who is scrambling and throws against his body to the middle of the field. And the receiver gets down to the five-yard line. Timeout taken. App State has first and goal from the five with 30 seconds left. They're calling all the shots. But then, and I didn't remember this at all, they make a very interesting decision. They don't have any timeouts, but they got first and goal from the five with 30 seconds left. Michigan has a timeout. Instead of App State kneeling the ball and then spiking it so they don't leave Michigan any time or kneeling it and making Michigan use their last timeout, they decide, you know what? We're just going to kick and we'll leave Michigan the time and the timeouts. Whatever. It's so indefensible even 13 years later. And I know they win the game. I know they block the kick. But it almost came back to bite them. And I can't believe it was a decision that they made, that they wouldn't even consider 
kneeling the ball, taking, you know, even 10 seconds off and spiking it and, you know, saving that time for themselves. I, I couldn't believe it on rewatching it. And so the guy makes the kick, but I, I was blown away that they wouldn't even make Michigan decide whether or not they wanted to use their timeout or just run the clock down so Michigan would have had like five seconds with the ball instead of the 26 that they got. And sure enough, it turns out that leaving them the time was bad because with 15 seconds left, Michigan's got the ball at their own 34-yard line and Chad Henney throws one of the most ridiculous deep balls I've ever seen at any level, NFL or college, end of game, uh, middle of the game, end of the first half, whatever. I don't think I've ever seen a deep ball like this. He throws it to Mario Manningham down the right sideline for 46 yards and they get to the App State 20 with six seconds left and they call a timeout. This ball, when guys say like, oh, that ball came down from the heavens, this ball literally flies out of the picture and it feels like it's up there forever. Like I went back and I timed it. The ball's in the air for almost four seconds. It's literally an arm punt and just falls right into Mario Manning's, Manningham's chest. It's one of the most amazing throws I've ever seen. And I don't know if I've seen a football in the air that long outside of maybe Cordell Stewart's Hail Mary against Michigan in 1994, which is funny. But I've never seen a throw like that. Every time I watch it, I'm always just amazed at how high he throws the ball and just like it just drops perfectly into Mario Manningham uh, and, and they get the ball down to the 20 yard line. They have a chance to kick a field goal and win the game. There's nothing about the last play that I can really say that hasn't been said or anything for me to expound upon it because it's one of the best plays in college football history. Corey Lynch comes through untouched, blocks the kick, scoops it up with one hand and tries to score. Probably would have been the most disrespectful touchdown in college football history. But he gets tackled inside the 10-yard line, leads to the biggest dog pile ever, players are going crazy, all that good stuff. It's the most poetic and fitting way that this game could have ever ended because Michigan didn't deserve to lose this game just on a kick. I think that would have been too abrupt, if that makes sense. If like if it's like wide right or wide left, you know, like the Florida State Miami series, I think it, it still would have been an awesome moment, and we would still be talking about it. But I think what makes this play so special is the way that it happened made not only all the fans in Michigan Stadium realize, but everybody around the college football universe realize, holy shit, Michigan just lost to App State. And while you're having that thought, the play is still going on and it's just dragging the misery out. But you can't say like it's over because this guy is streaking down the sideline. It's not just like a missed kick. It was this like eight second long play where you already know the, the game is over, but it's happened so quickly that you're processing it while it's still happening. I, I think it's one of the most beautiful ways a game has ever ended. I hope that makes even a little bit of sense, but in, in rewatching that, that's all I could come up with was like a missed kick would have been great and it would still be a great moment, but the way it ends makes you realize as it's happening, all the 100,000 Michigan fans are witnessing this moment, but the moment is just dragging out through eternity. My favorite thing about the celebration, other than the dog pile, which is, it's gotta be the greatest dog pile of all time. They're just, they're right in front of the Michigan cheerleaders. They're right in front of the end zone. They're just, it's basically a 50 person dog pile. Is uh, Jerry Moore still has his headset on when Carissa Thompson goes over and interviews him. And I think she like apologizes for like, oh, I should have given you a second before I interviewed you. But I, I've never seen that before or since. And it's it's so awesome because it's a moment that like literally nobody was prepared for. And then it happens. And you can tell that everybody, whether it's the Michigan fans or the players on the negative spectrum or the App State players and coaches and that small contingent of fans they had there, everybody is in awe of this moment and just doesn't really know what to do. And really, it's just it's just awesome. And it's it's held up so well 13 years later. And, you know, by itself, it's it's one of the greatest college football moments and games 
and it's worth watching and talking about alone, just just for that, just the game in the vacuum. But I think what takes it to the next level is the aftermath of the game. Not only the immediate for both teams that season, but its lasting legacy that is left on the game of college football. That's what that's why I wanted to start with this one. The immediate aftermath for Michigan is a complete disaster. You look and they're the story of the sports world. It makes the Sports Illustrated cover, which for the younger listeners, that was a huge deal back in the day. And that's one where I still have that issue at my parents' house down in the basement somewhere. And the second that I move out of this apartment and get my first house, I'm going to have my mom send that thing over and I'm framing that son of a bitch. And that's the first thing I'm putting up on a wall. I love that cover of SI. So it's it's the story of the sports world. And Michigan is really getting clowned by everybody. But on the field, it gets worse for them. Because the next week, they play Oregon at home on ABC. And that's also a game worth watching. And at the start of the game, they go up 7-3. It looks like, okay, these guys have, you know, last week was a fluke. These guys have bounced back. They're ready to play. And then they give up 36 unanswered points. They end up losing 39-7. to It's 32 to seven at half. Oregon really lets off the gas, but Oregon scores touchdowns of 85, 46, and 61 yards. Uh, Dennis Dixon scores on a fake statue of Liberty play. I said that Corey Lynch picking up the, the block field goal would have been the most disrespectful touchdown in history. That Dennis Dixon fake statue of Liberty may actually be the most disrespectful touchdown in history. Michigan has no idea what to do all game, and the crowd pretty much boos them. From start to finish, and it's just a it's a huge embarrassment. There's some legendary crowd shots. There's a guy that has a sign that says something like, at least we're still undefeated in FBS play. Like there's some surrender cobras. It's it's really wild to listen and to watch the crowd throughout the course of that Oregon game. It it goes to show how quick fortunes can change in college football because whatever eight months prior to those two games that Michigan played to start the 2007 season, they were a win away from playing for the national championship. If they beat Ohio State, and you know I said it earlier, Bo Schembechler dies, and then they lose to Ohio State, they lose to USC, they lose to App State in the biggest upset of all time, and then they get housed by Oregon. It's their first four-game losing streak since 1967, and honestly, it's that's the final straw for the Lloyd Carr era. At Michigan, and I think I, I said it earlier. I just said it now. Lost in the whole shuffle of talk about Michigan in this era, I think is Bo Schembechler dying. And I, I don't want to say that they went on a four-game losing streak because of that, but I don't think it's a coincidence that things kind of played out the way that they did. And in retrospect, it it makes more sense that this is what happened. And you know, Michigan gets on track. They get hot, and they win eight straight games and they go into the last couple games of the season against Wisconsin and Ohio State with an undefeated Big Ten record, but they get worked by Wisconsin pretty good. And then, you know, I don't remember if Lloyd Carr had outright said he was retiring or it was just kind of known. Everybody knew it was his last game coaching at Michigan Stadium against Ohio State. And it's one of the worst games you'll ever watch. Ohio State wins 14 to three. Beanie Wells has like 260 yards rushing and whenever I see that game, I'm pretty convinced that Jim Trestle went out of his way to not embarrass Lloyd Carr in that game. Because at that point, he was 1-5 in five against Trestle. And it was already kind of a meme that Lloyd Carr couldn't beat him. And I, I really do believe that Trestle went out of his way to show him respect and to not embarrass him and to have that be his final moment in Michigan Stadium. Ohio State, they knew they were the better team. You, you know, they were they ended up playing for the national championship, but they kind of figured they were going to the Rose Bowl and I really think Trestle um, made a strong effort to not embarrass him and to do that to him in his last game. But things take a little bit of a happier turn for Michigan because they end up in the Capital One Bowl against Florida, who at that point, they're the defending national champions, and Tim Tebow has just won the Heisman, and Michigan wins in a really crazy and also very rewatchable game. Michigan wins that one, and and Lloyd Carr goes out a winner in his last game there, and it'd be easy to say, like, oh, all's well that ends well, but it's kind of hard to in retrospect given 
everything that was about to happen at Michigan with Rich Rodriguez and the kind of infighting and the he said, she said about whether Carr, you know, helped him or hindered Rodriguez at all. But it's just, it's interesting to see that that's how it ended and that's who they beat. And um, it's important to note that this is the first and only time that Michigan beat Urban Meyer. So they've got that going for them. And then for App State, they kind of ride the wave for a little bit. They do lose to Wofford and Georgia Southern later on that season, but they're able to make it back to the FCS playoffs, and they play Delaware in the FCS national title game, and they beat them, and they win their third straight title. So hell of a season for App State, and a fun note, uh, the quarterback in that game for Delaware is Joe Flacco. That's a great game as well, a lot of fun plays in that game and cool to watch that this App State team uh, played Joe Flacco in a national championship game. That's the immediate aftermath for both teams, but looking back on it 13 years later, this game is, is, I don't know if Titanic is the right word, but that's what I'm going to say. Its legacy is Titanic. It's huge. It's the biggest upset in college football history. It's a top five holy shit moment in college football history. The other four in any order you want are Cal Stanford when the band comes out on the field, the kick six between Auburn and Alabama, uh, Woody Hayes punching a player while he was still a coach. And then it's not a game, but the the whole Manti Teo story. I don't know if we'll ever see anything like that again, but it's top five at the very least. And I think you can make a case that it's number one. Like I said, made the cover of SI and was a huge deal. And then from an X's and O's standpoint, it kind of helped legitimize the spread. And it's weird to say that now, and especially to younger people, because the spread is everywhere. The spread is in the NFL. You know, you have guys like Kyler Murray and Baker Mayfield going as the the number one picks. And it's just kind of accepted that it's the norm now. And it's, you know, permeated the highest levels of football. But back then, there was a lot of talking down when it came to teams that did this. And it was mostly, you know, referred to as a strategy that lesser talented teams had to use to win. Like, oh, you have to, you got to do that. You got to go no huddle and run shotgun to win games. Like it it was very uh, derogatory when it came to talking about the spread. But in this era, that really starts to change. And it, it was still a foreign concept to a lot of people. And even though Florida had just won the national championship with it literally seven months prior there was still conversations of you know can can you win with the spread can you win at the the highest levels so it it was still in that infancy stage maybe not infancy stage because it had been around for a while but in terms of how people talked about it on a national level it still wasn't accepted and it really took a lot of time for it to get to where it is now Tied in with that is also this was the height of the Big Ten speed era, which if you were around for, you you know what I'm talking about, where it was just another black eye for the conference in a series of black eyes that, that started really with Ohio State losing that national championship to Florida. And that stretch pretty much lasts, I would say, until Urban Meyer shows up. There's some big moments for the Big Ten within that from 2007 to 2012 Ohio State wins uh, the Sugar Bowl over Arkansas Wisconsin has a pretty good run there's some Outback Bowl wins and and whatnot but for the Big Ten they were just taking hits left and right in this era and and watching uh, a southern team from the southern conference in the FCS run circles around Michigan really permeated or really played into that uh, talking point about the Big Ten lacking speed and, and looking at Michigan's linebackers and how big they were and how these you know Division One AA players were able to just totally boat race them and then looking at Ohio State losing another national championship to LSU then getting wrecked by USC that next season this was the the Big Ten's biggest dogs weren't doing so hot in this era. And uh, the the Big Ten, it took a lot of time for them to get out of that. So that's another thing that I I think kind of ties into the spread is the Big Ten was still very plotting and defensively there was a lot of size and it took a really long time for all of that to change. 
this game also left a big mark in broadcasting in the history of uh, conference networks. Like I said earlier, this was BTN's first game broadcast. And even though Michigan lost and it was a really dark moment for the conference, it's probably a really great thing that it happened this way because it made people think like, oh, well, I got to get this network now. Or at the time, I got to call my cable provider to you know, see if we can get Big Ten Network. And it took a lot of time and they were they bore the brunt of a lot of jokes about how this thing was going to fail. And then you fast forward 13 years and, you know, what's the big money maker in college sports or one of the big money makers and what everybody wants to have. It's these conference networks. And for whatever people want to say about Jim Delaney and whatever I've said about him, you know, this, this move to start this network was huge. And even though Michigan got embarrassed on this stage it's a really integral part to i think big 10 networks legacy and uh what would happen in the landscape of college football on tv going forward and then lastly i see that i'm getting around an hour so i'm going to try to wrap this up because i could end up i could go for three hours about this game and what it meant um i'll talk about app state it really gave them name recognition you know it's the old trope if If you say App State to somebody, what's the first thing that's going to pop up? Or they're going to say, oh, that's the school that beat Michigan. But it gave them a lot of cachet. And they eventually moved up to the FBS level in 2014. And after a year of adjustment, they've been one of the best programs in the country. Not just G5, but among everybody. In the last five seasons, they're 54 and 12. They went 13 and 1 last year. And they're 5 and 0 in bowl games since moving up, which is so impressive. So App State, uh, that's another thing that's cool about this is App State didn't just beat Michigan and then fade off into obscurity. And we were like, oh, where's App State now? And someone's like, oh yeah, they dropped down to division three. Like it just didn't work out with their football program, but they're pretty good there. Like, no, they, they've they moved up and they're still kicking teams' asses and big boys still really don't want to play them you know, right now because they're so good. So for App State, I, I think it's awesome that they have this moment, but they can also be like, hey, we've won 54 games the last five years. They don't have to just rest on one thing. And so App State's football program continues to just churn out wins. And, and I think that's something that's really neat about this. And it, it wasn't just a fly-by-night type of upset. It was just this major moment that happened while they were having great success. And then they continued to build on that. And, you know, who's to say that they can't keep winning more and, you know, achieve bigger things as they keep going because they've just had so much success. So that's pretty much it. That's a good place to wrap up. If that wasn't a good enough sell job for an hour, I don't know what is about this game. It's one of the best games of all time. And it's it's so worth a watch. It's aged perfectly. And there's a lot that happens in it before it and after it that are worth keeping up with and reading about because it really has a special place in college football. And it's it's not just something that happened inside of a vacuum, but it's something that has affected the game 13 years later. So I really love this game just outside of it being a, a catastrophic Michigan loss. It's it's just a, it's a very fun rewatch. And whenever I get the chance to check it out. I always do. So I hope you guys watched it. I hope you enjoyed this podcast and I was able to shed some new light on something that has honestly been talked about a lot, but this is one that's uh, one of my favorites ever and thought I'd start out this distant replay series with it. So I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to subscribe to the show. Just search Two Stripes Podcast. I am on Spotify, Apple, SoundCloud, also on YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash Colton Denning. You'll find this episode, all the other Distant Replay episodes, hopefully coming up soon that I record, and my highlight videos if you want to pass the time. I got all those up there as well. I'll probably wait about a week or two to do another one, but I have the next episode for uh, Distant Replay already in my mind. I'm going to start taking notes, hopefully not 16 pages like I did for this one. I don't know if I need that many. But uh, I'm already looking forward to that. So stay tuned to that and uh, keep up with the show. Thank you guys for listening one more time. I hope you all are staying 
safe and healthy and we can all get through this together if we work together. So best wishes out to all of you and all of your families. I hope you guys uh, stay safe and we can make this out the other end better and stronger. Until next time though, this has been Distant Replay on the Two Stripes Podcast. My name is Colton Denning and I'll talk to you soon.